One of the reasons that we decided we wanted to talk about planetary science and, and the exploration of our solar system, this uh, Earth Talks series, is that right now we live in the golden age of planetary science. There's literally dozens of, of mission concepts being developed and, and flying right now. Uh, this is what's called the NASA Planetary Science Fleet uh, map, which they, they like to show at uh, NASA headquarters, likes to show it at various events. It basically shows all the active uh, NASA missions that are funded right now uh, in planetary science. Um, some of them are still in, in uh, development phase, like, for example, Dragonfly in the lower middle that's going out to Saturn. So we live at a very uh, very remarkable time to be in, in humanity of going out and, and studying these, these bodies in, in great detail. Of course, planetary science as a field started in the late 60s, and, uh, and it was, the, for example, the 1968 Apollo 8 Earth, uh, Earthrise image that uh, really capture, cap captured the, the public's imagination and helped launch the environmental movement. So there's long, there's long been a synergy between earth science, environmental science, and planetary science. And that synergy goes beyond just beautiful images to using the same techniques, whether the, whether the instrument is pointed at our own world or pointed at a different world, we use the same instruments. Many of the same scientists are both uh, uh, space scientists who study Earth and space study, su space scientists who study other worlds. Uh, in fact, the famed clim climate scientist Jim Henson became engaged in understanding Earth's uh, environmental uh, crisis and, and our Earth's atmosphere after having first studied Venus and, and seen uh, its atmosphere. So uh, Penn State has launched an initiative in planetary science, and we're starting to, uh, this, this se seminar series is part of that initiative. We have uh, Last fall had a new search for a new faculty member in planetary science, and, and, uh, and now we're continuing on to, to have discussions about planetary science and how it fits in with Penn State's uh, future. So this is an image of planetary science, NASA's planetary science fleet, and there are similar fleets for uh, helioscience, astrophysics, and earth science. And so to give you a sense, here is, here is the earth science fleet, uh, again, from NASA. So, so equally, uh, more or less equal in, 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 in magnitude. All right, now moving on to my talk, I need to first introduce isotopes in order to, to get on to carbon, this carbon we discovered on Mars. Um, and, and so uh, what, you, what people often know is that there are different isotopes of carbon. In fact, there's carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, but only carbon-12 and thir 13 are stable. So that means the amount of carbon-12 and 13 we got at the beginning of the solar system, we've had it forever since, and uh, it doesn't get created nor destroyed. It has similar chemistry, but with different reaction rates. And so because the reaction rates are different for molecules that have uh, thir carbon-13 versus carbon-12, then it can end up, the, the ratio of carbon-13 to 12 can change uh, within uh, different uh, reservoirs on Earth as different processes happen. So, it's a, so it ends up being a way to, to study the carbon cycle. Uh, the reason that their reaction rates are different uh, is that uh, well, at least there's several reasons, but they include things like the bonds that C13 make are stronger uh, and that C12 molecules can move faster. So that leads to isotope fractionation. And I'm going to uh, give you three or or three flavors of isotope fractionation, uh, and they all involve carbon, and they, and, and they all are somewhat related to the story today. Uh, one is there's equilibrium fractionation. So that's a case where, say, your product, your A is going to B, but your B can also go back to A. So the reaction uh, between A and B is reversible. If it's completely reversible, then the, the, the reaction will come to equilibrium. And if you have reaction rates be different for carbon-12 molecules versus carbon-13 containing molecules, then you'll also get an equilibrium fractionation. Uh, and, and what ha happens, tends to happen, is that the carbon-13 ends up in, um, in the, the uh, uh, the more uh, stable uh, of the two molecules. So in this case, um, this, ex this example though with, carb uh, with carbonate buffer system is CO2 gas dissolving into water and ultimately disassociating to carbonate, into, uh, sorry, into bicarbonate. And that's, that would be, if, that, if you ran that in a bottle, if you had a water and you had CO2 and you just let it come to equilibration, then you would also equilibrate the isotopes and there would be a, there would be a difference uh, between the, car the CO2, the isotopes of the CO2 and the isotopes of bicarbonate. Um, in that case, the, uh, well, I'll come back to that. The, 
if it, the re reaction is not reversible, A just goes to B, that's a kinetic fractionation. So this example here uh, happens to be photosynthesis or carbon fixation, CO2 and water becoming biomass, and that's a, a, a unidirectional biological re reaction. And so it doesn't have an equilibrium fractionation, but instead has a kinetic fractionation. And then finally, on the bottom, you could have some very unusual processes uh, having up in the atmosphere where you can get photo, you can, at, you can get atmospheric photochemical fractionation. So a photo a molecule can get, inter, get hit by a photon and that can cause a fractionation too. That, that's different in that it's independent of mass. It's, it has to do, the amount of fractionation occurs follows different rules, follows quantum rules instead of um, mass, mass rules. So the, the, it's harder to predict uh, what the fractionation might be and the fractionations can be quite large. So in this exa these examples, uh, the first example, um, you would have had C13 enriched by carbonate, and you would have had C13 depleted CO2. In the second example, you would get C13 depleted biomass. And the third example, you would get C13 depleted formaldehyde. All right, so I mentioned this is it. carbon isotopes are interesting because we, we like carbon, we're interested in carbon, and we, we're interested in the Earth's carbon cycle. Um, and, and so if you look at the, I'm going to contrast this a little bit later on when we learn about Mars. But if you look at the carbon cycle on Earth, you have, um, you know, biology being playing a very, very large role. Obviously, uh, for example, the atmosphere has some carbon dioxide in it. And that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a mix then of what came out of volcanoes, what came out of uh, uh, power plants for, for the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and so there can be mixes in these different reservoirs. You can imagine if you, if, you, if you looked at the different reservoirs, you'd see different carbon isotope ratios. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a nice uh, example. I want to put some beautiful pictures in along the way. Some nice, nice mud cracks. But this actually is not Earth. This is actually Mars. So just want to throw in some Mars pictures along the way. All right, so this is now the carbon cycle looking at, uh, the Earth's carbon cycle looking at it from an isotope standpoint. Um, and so I, I, I don't, this is, looks a little more complicated than it really needs to be. Uh, the, the really complicated factor uh, is that uh, we report our carbon isotopes relative to a universally agreed upon standard. And that standard is this little um, fossil from South Carolina, PD Belenite. And, uh, and, and so that happens because it's a, uh, the standard is a carbonate. Then when you look at the earth today, carbonate rocks tend to be around zero on our scale. They tend to have the same composition as the standard we're reporting our, our results to, which is this fossil. So in terms of, of uh, this one slide uh, isotope uh, lecture here, um, if you looked at the, the earth today, the carbonate rock is about zero on our scale because it's close to it's similar to the standard material that we're set our scale to. Once you set your scale that way, then, um, then biomass is very negative. So like minus 25 per mil on the scale, or per mil is parts per thousand. So parts per thousand depleted in C13 relative to, to, this, uh, to this carbonate, this calcium carbonate. Uh, the atmosphere is, is uh, a little bit uh, depleted relative to the, the, the standard. PD belenite as well. Um, you can see it was, it's gotten even more depleted over time as we burnt more fossil fuels. So I was saying earlier, the atmosphere is a mix of, of both what um, comes out of, the, of volcanoes in terms of the mantle carbon, and also what comes out of power plants. The whole earth itself, if you were to grind up the earth and put in a mass spectrometer, which I don't recommend we do, it's something like minus five or minus six per mil on the scale, which is what's coming out of volcanoes. And then another uh, reservoir that's notable is this uh, on the lower left here is that methane coming out of seafloor can be highly, highly depleted in C13. So minus 40 to minus 110 per mil for methane, uh, often around minus 55 on the ocean vents. So it's these left two fractionations, which are quite large, both photosynthesis, taking dissolved inorganic carbon and making biomass, which goes from about zero down to about minus 28, or also the production of methane, which is taking organic matter, burying it in the seafloor, and de uh, microbially converting it into methane. Those are, are large biological fractionations, uh, which, make, which really impart, imp impose 
a large signal on the whole carbon cycle. So there's a, these are those two signals. You have carbon fixation, CO2 plus, bio, or plus water going to biomass, about minus 26 per, uh, per mil discrimination of, of, uh, of, uh, C, of discriminating the C13 from the C12. And then methanogenesis, which is taking CO2 and reducing it to methane or taking small biological molecules, organic molecules like um, a methanol or uh, acetate and making methane out of it. Those are processes that happen in the C4 after the, the burial of organic matter. And those also have fractionations. So, and when you make methane, you're, you're fractionating twice because first, first you're taking CO2 and making biomass, and then you're burying that biomass deep, deep into the earth or into the sediment and making methane. So, so again, that's why the methane can be quite depleted. When I got involved uh, almost about 20 years ago, uh, um, we're, we're working on carbon, working on, on carbon as a signature, a biosignature. Um, I, I got involved with techniques where you could measure the carbon isotopes of single cells. Uh, so here's showing in the lower left. These are two different cell types, a long rod and a little sphere. And one time we labeled it with C13, uh, um, I, I, uh, isotopically labeled C13. And you can see that the, the long one grew in the label and the short one didn't. Um, also, we went and studied the same technique. This is using an iron beam to hit a cell and eject carbon from the cell, and then you get the isotopes of that carbon. And we looked at methane seeps, where there were known to be these uh, consortium of, of RKL uh, cells living with bacterial sulfate reducing cells. The RKL are, are in red, here stained, and the sulfate reducers are in green. And as we analyzed them, uh, cell by, or carbon by carbon, uh, burning through this consortium using this cesium beam, you could see dramatic changes in the carbon isotopes from, in this case, minus 60 all the way almost to minus 100 per mil because the, the and that was definitive ge uh, geochemical proof that methane was being consumed by, by the interior of, of the, the consortium, the, the archaea. They were growing on methane. On the right, this shows the same kind of work. This is a sediment core as you go down through the sediment. You, uh, these are different cell types. The red ones are the archaea. Uh, and in green are the are the are the bacteria, and you can see sometimes uh, there's just dramatic differences in carbon isotopes from minus 30 all the way to minus almost minus 90 uh, per mil. It's big big signals because these things grow on methane. All right, one thing that um, the NASA is. Uh, oh, sorry. So here is. I just got out. Um, so <laughs> this is out of place. Never mind. We'll just keep going. Okay, so we are interested in biosignatures. Um, I'm gonna, there's different types of biosignatures. You can look at the morphology of fossils. You can look at elemental ratios, how much of the nitrogen, how much carbon, how much phosphorus they have. You can look at isotopes, uh, which we were just talking about. You look at uh, biological st structures. These are all different ways to look at it, but all of them could potentially have uh, false positives, uh, ways that would, they could be fooled by abiotic processes. Uh, going on, you could have atmosphere gases, looking at the atmospheres of exoplanets, looking at whether they have methane and, and oxygen. Uh, you can potentially, using uh, techniques we don't even have any envisioned yet, one ultimately could look for uh, uh, grand constructions of civilizations. But in all these cases, there could be pitfalls. And so one of the things that NASA headquarters has been very interested in the last few years about is how do we prioritize different biosignatures? How do they work together? How do you use one biosignature uh, with another one? Uh, can any one be a, a smoking gun or not? Um, and, and here's a couple of papers. I can't, can't see the top, I'm sorry about that. Um, from NASA headquarters uh, involving scientists and NASA, and NASA headquarters and, and elsewhere, uh, talking about different biosignatures. Oops, sorry. Um, and and um, so these are all different aspects of biology. And then, um, Th things that people observe about biology, like growth and rep reproduction, metabolism, cell structures, and then whether or not it could be uh, a, a really strong biosignature from no to high uh, ranked in, in different, uh, different uh, levels. And it, within there is isotopes somewhere. Um, it should be here, low to medium on this particular paper. The right, another paper that came in at NASA headquarters was saying, well, how, you know, how far along do you think you are to declaring there's life somewhere 
from level one, you might have seen something that life could possibly have done, to level seven, where independent other scientists have confirmed what you discovered, and somewhere, you know, where are we at right now? We're at some level two or, or three, you know, and so we have a long way to go for, for using biosignatures and, and exploring them. And the reason I wanted to talk, mention all that is that I'm going to talk about highly depleted carbon on Mars, which sounds like something that life might, might create. And so we want to keep these sort of, this sort of logic in mind while we talk about it. Uh, another, another concept put out in this first paper is this idea of a last resort hypothesis, meaning you've gone through all the steps and you're certain you saw what you saw. Uh, how can you possibly, can you come up with some dream up some way in which an abiotic process might produce the same signal? That would be this last resort. You, you don't want to go to life unless it's the last resort hypothesis is another concept. All right, I'm going to move ahead. So I went on sabbatical to, to join the Mars Science Laboratory mission. This is what I was imagining would happen to me on Mars. Um, I was also imagining this, that I would be, you know, driving the rover um, with some sort of controller. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you exactly what it felt, what uh, being on a mission is like. It's this. Uh, incorrect user password. This, yeah. So anyway, um, this is science by telecon. You wake up, uh, you know, eight, the science mission starts at 8 a.m. on in Pasadena time. There are scientists that are logging in from Europe who are doing it after dinner. There are scientists in the East Coast that are it's about 11 a.m. It's pretty, pretty easy to be an East Coast scientist. There are scientists in Hawaii. They have a rough time. The ones in Japan have a really rough time. Um, we're all logging in at the same time. We see the new images that came up. We have to prioritize what the rover's going to do that day. I'm literally doing it in my home office with, a big, with several big screens. Um, and and uh, by, you know, uh, several hours later, we know what the rover will do. And several hours after that, it can be sent, the messages can be sent uh, uplinked to the, to the Mars um, orbiters that then will downlink it to the, to the uh, rover. And the rover will then have those instructions for the next day. So it's, it's one day at a time, essentially, playing the, the next day's activities. And you end up with beautiful pictures like this. So this is, uh, this is looking up at Mount Sharp in, in Gale Crater. Sometimes you'll see the sky being blue. The sky, in blue, the sky on Mars is not blue, except maybe in Total Recall. Um, that's too old, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and so if, that's just, just a reminder that in planetary science, images are not often in true color as your eye would see them. They're often um, stretched. It's not false color. They're not adding a color to the image. They're simply stretching the image, the, the wavelengths, um, the assignment of the colors to the wavelengths that the, the, that the instrument detected. Uh, so if you, if you didn't do that, if you looked at Jupiter, it'd just be a big white ball, maybe slightly off-white. But as soon as you enrich those reds, get into the infrared even, now you see those stripes and those beautiful, the red spot. Yeah, the red spot's not actually red. Is that, is that just killing everybody? <laughs> it's reddish, it's okay. So anyway, when you do that, the sky then goes from being white to being blue. So now you learn something. All right. Um, and I want to talk about carbon on Mars. So uh, this is a, kind of a history of our, our love affair with carbon on Mars. 1976, the Viking landers uh, failed to detect organic carbon on Mars. That might not sound like much. It was a failure. Um, it was not a failed mission. It's the reason I say that the Viking landers failed to detect organic carbon on Mars is the entire expectation of the mission would be that there would be plenty of carbon. The, 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 the instruments were designed to say, okay, once you see lots of carbon, because we know there's lots of carbon there coming in from meteorites, how do we then decide whether there's, there is or is not a rich uh, organic biosphere eating that carbon and living on Mars? So it was, it was, an, it was really a, a mission designed around looking for an active microbial soil like you have on Earth, and there isn't one. So, so it was a very successful mission in that sense. Um, then in 1996, um, organic material was reported from the Allen Hills 84001 meteorite, which came from Mars, landed in Antarctica. Uh, 2009, Phoenix lander detected perchlorate in the Martian soil. Perchlorate is a little bit like bleach, um, and it, gave, it, gave, it provided an explanation for why the Viking lander didn't see any organic matter. It actually did, the Viking lander did actually see methyl chloride, methyl chlorine, um, which, they, which they had used to actually clean the instruments. They assumed it was contamination. 
but it's actually not contamination. There is actually methyl chloride coming out of samples on Mars because when you heat up the samples in the oven of the, of this, of the instrument, the perchlorate reacts with organic matter and makes methyl chloride. So, so that's a byproduct of essentially like a combustion process of reacting perchlorate with organic matter. 2013, there was unusual amino acid detected uh, in uh, a Mars meteorite. That's shown here, that's uh, N-butyric acid. It's not a very well-known paper, but a really spectacular discovery. Uh, the first probably identified Martian organic matter uh, is, uh, was reported only uh, about 10 years ago. Um, in 2015, uh, the Curiosity team, that's the Mars Science Laboratory mission, reported chlorobenzene at Gale Crater. So now we have chloromethane and chlorobenzene, and they're products of taking the Mars. So you drill into Mars, you take the powder, you put it in an oven, you heat it up, and that perchlorate is reacting with that organic matter, and it ends up making methyl chloride and methyl, um, sorry, uh, chlorobenzene and methyl chloride. So this is here is a, a structure of methyl chloride. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ah, chlorobenzene. Okay. Um, this should be 2018. 2018, we reported uh, thiophane. That was Jen Eigenbrode's paper. She was a graduate student here at Penn State. She was lead author reporting thiophane and, and, th and other related sulfur-containing molecules at Gale Crater. So there's thiophane. And then last year, there's a whole slew. I probably missed some other reports, but... Um, wanted to get to what happened last year, a number of, of really interesting papers came out all really very much at the same time. Uh, one, right, to kick off a year ago, right about a year ago as of today, uh, that we've, was a report that the Allen Hills 84001 organic matter, which was first discovered in 1996, there was a paper confirming that it's there, it's indigenous, it's from Mars, and it appears to be formed during serpentinization, which is a water-rock interaction. Water, water hydrates minerals, and you can get uh, carbon forming that way uh, from CO2. Uh, and so really spectacular paper saying we actually understand why there's organic matter on Mars from a discovery that was uh, back in 1996. And, um, and it doesn't look like biology, actually. It looks like an abiotic process. Then uh, Curiosity team reported diverse organics uh, in clay-rich sediments. So now you've moved beyond chlorobenzene and methyl chloride, um, and, and now you have um, a whole slew of organic matter on, on Mars that we know about. Uh, the Perseverance team, that's, there's two similar rovers on Mars. So that's the Mars 2020 mission, which is collecting samples for sample return to be brought back to Earth. They for, had their first papers uh, published last year, and they also reported organic matter this is a different side of Mars. This is Jezero Crater. And then finally, uh, we had a pair of papers from Curiosity team report carbon isotope values from uh, sediments. These, so this is getting back to the point of my talk of isotope ratios. So now we can actually look at what would be sort of a Mars uh, carbon cycle. If you get isotopes, you can start to understand the carbon cycle. All right. This is a lot of information here because it, it summarizes um, three different papers. There's three different papers from Curiosity that involve isotopes of, of organic matter. First, uh, from Heather Franz in 2017, using 17 different samples uh, from the Curiosity uh, rover transect, there was a report of carbon isotopes ranging from, from as low as, as C13 depleted as, minus 25. So on our scale, this is the same scale. That would be similar to organic matter in our ocean, for example, up to plus 56. We don't have plus 56 on Earth at all. That, that's not, that, that doesn't happen. So you can see how dramatically different now Mars is. All of a sudden, you should be thinking about, whoa, wait a second. You know, Mars, Mars doesn't operate as like Earth. We know that's, that it's a different place. Um, if you're wondering, well, how in the world do you ever get plus 56? Turns out the atmosphere of Mars is plus 45. So while our, our atmosphere, if you remember back to that slide, was minus seven, slightly C13 depleted, the Martian atmosphere is already quite enriched to levels that we don't see on Earth at all. The reason for that is that, that, that Mars has losing its atmosphere. And as it loses its atmosphere, 
it loses carbon-12 CO2 faster than it loses carbon-13 CO2, leaving the atmosphere enriched in, in its isotopes. That doesn't mean we totally understand plus 56, but at least we're not that far off. Um, second pa paper, uh, last year, uh, these are actually slight, uh, out of order in which they're published. I think this is the way we should have published them, but that never quite happens right when you try to get papers to roll out the way they, we want them to roll out. Um, Jen Stern led a paper looking at um, the isotopes from a, from a particular mudstone that was drilled by the Curiosity rover on Mars, uh, doing a, a combustion experiment. So now you're taking that, you're drilling the sample, taking the, the powder, and you're heating up, but you're heating up with oxygen in the headspace. So you're trying to convert all the carbon over into CO2, get as much of it converted to CO2 as possible. So it's it's more like a bulk sample, bulk bulk analysis. And you can do that with a step oven, stepping the temperature up. And so the low temperature step, which is up to 550 degrees C, if you care, uh, report, uh, released almost 1,000 micrograms of carbon per, per gram. And so that just tells you how much is there, basically. You're, you're oxidizing all the carbon and getting a bulk analysis of how much is in that sample. Um, now, that is, though, a mix of probably organic matter and carbonate. It's hard to distinguish the two in this experiment. One way to distinguish them, though, is to use the isotopes. And so if you look at the low temperature carbon, about 1,000 micrograms of carbon per gram of sediment, and the isotopes are, are very close to PDB plus 1.5, so very close to carbonate values on Earth. Um, now, this is still, even though it's like Earth carbonate, it's very, it's, it's nowhere near that atmosphere of Mars, a plus 45. So this could still be a mix of organic carbon and, 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 and carbonate carbon. It'd be very hard to tell the difference. We just don't know. Then you go to the high temperature cut. This is over 550 degrees C. You get another 270 micrograms of carbon per gram of sediment and the value is minus 16 per mil. Um, again, you know, we don't know much about Mars, so what do we compare it to? One thing that that is similar to is, is, is carbon in igneous Martian rock. If you look at Martian meteorites, there's actually carbon in the igneous rock, in the basalt, and that has a composition around minus 20 per mil. So this value is similar to igneous carbon on Mars. But we don't know that's what it is, because uh, uh, another problem here is if you, if you want to take your plus 1.5 that you know is there, carbonate, and you want to get minus 16 for a different cut, you might end up having a mix. This minus, minus 16 might be a mix of one, plus 1.5 and say minus 30 in order to get an intermediate value. So these are, these are bulk numbers for low temperature carbon and high temperature carbon coming out of powders. Um, and they're a little bit hard to interpret, but we do know that they, they imply a mix of carbonate and organic matter. Then the weirdest data set is the last one. It's what I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about, the rest of the talk talking about, yes, uh, which is 24 solid samples spending nine years of rover exploration uh, using the tunable laser spectrometer uh, instrument, which is, which is a different way to get the isotopes. Um, and this is paralysis, not combustion, and looking at methane, methane that was produced from the sample. So it's not all the carbon. We know there's a very, very small amount of the carbon is coming off as methane. But what's wild is it's coming off with really crazy isotope values, as depleted as minus 137 and as rich as plus 22, uh, with two samples being plus 22 and about six different locations on Mars giving highly depleted values. Now, as one who you know, already was fortunate enough to get weird isotopes earlier in my career, I felt very fortunate to get weird isotopes again in my career. So I naturally thought about methane and methane seeps quickly and, 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 and as soon as I saw these results, but it took several more years of thought and work before we could write a paper about it. And one thing we did was we looked at, um, at what kind of um, uh, isotope fractionation we should get from the instrument itself on Mars. So you put material into, a, into the oven, you heat it up, what's the fractionation caused by that process? And so these are experiments on the left where we, we mixed different materials together and, can, and acted like they were in the SAM instrument on Mars and looked at the methane coming off and looked how much fractionation there was. And we could have 
uh, up, you know, up to 40 per mil or more uh, of fractionation in the instrument if there was CO2 reduction. If it was starting off as a carbonate and being reduced to methane, you could get a large fractionation, kind of like methanogenesis on Earth. But if you started as organic matter, there was almost no fractionation, especially if you started off with uh, organic matter that had methyl groups that could just come off as methane. There was essentially no fractionation. Uh, so this is all from CO2 reduction in these experiments. About minus about 30 per mil fractionation when you do CO2 reduction. You compare that to literature about CO2 reduction from literature, uh, hydrothermal experiments, hydrothermal uh, lab, other people's hydrothermal work is rather similar, forming ethane, uh, methane, ethane. Um, and also you look at volcanoes, abiotic, where you think there might be abiotic CO2 reduction, you get similar results. And then finally, look at the right, you look at methanogenesis and biology. It often is similar to abiotic carbon isofractionation, except in a few cases. And those few cases are when the microbe is growing under very low hydrogen conditions. Then you get this really, really large isofractionation. So that's what we learned, just trying to understand. The main point was that we could get some fractionation, but we couldn't get minus 137. There was no, there was no way the oven was going to give us enough fractionation to just wave our hands away and not have to explain this data to the world. So going back to, the, to what we did. Okay, so this is the study. So we have Mars powder. We drilled, the rover drilled the powder, put it in the oven, heated up, released methane. The tunable laser spectrometer looked at that methane using a 3.27 micron laser uh, and looked at the absorbance, absorbances lines uh, for C13 methane and C12 methane. And we were able to then calculate isotope ratios. And the values then were minus 137 as low as minus 137 to as high as plus 22. Two samples were enriched. Nine samples were highly depleted, including six different locations on, on Get Gale Crater. And I underlined six different locations because I think it's critically important that this is rep re reproducible. Otherwise, if it was just a one-off number from one sample, I would just not worry about it. All right. And there's some thought that maybe these six different locations are associated with the paleo surface. All right, um, this is the actual data set. In blue are the samples that showed highly depleted C13 values here, minus 133, minus 88, minus 178, minus 133, et cetera. And then in the middle, in orange, is another analysis we did based on the sulfur gases coming off to, to, to determine whether or not we thought there was reduced sulfur, like sulfides or organic matter, organic sulfur, in the sample, if there's pyrite, for example. And, and it, we noticed that there's a, a lot of the same samples give both the highly reduced, high, highly depleted carbon coming off and the reduced sulfur. And similarly, we have sulfur isotopes. A lot of the same samples give negative sulfur isotopes as give highly depleted carbon. So there seems to be something going on with the carbon and the sulfur together. This is what the actual instrument data looks like. You get, you, you get absorption lines that deal with, these are C12 lines. There's an E, F, and a G line. And these are C13 lines, the A, B, C, and D line. You can see the C13 lines are very small because there's not much C13 methane, but, um, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's, it's a strong signal. And hidden lower right here shows kind of the, the correlation, if you want to call it that, where this, the samples that tend to show the very highly C13 depleted methane are also the samples that show the highly depleted uh, sulfur isotopes. And then I was talking about um, where these samples come from. Uh, so they come from all over Gale Crater. This is the very where the the, the spacecraft landed on this orange. It's um, sorry, not orange. This green star, and drove over to this yellow location here. That location. Uh, is called, we, we named Yellowknife Bay. I wasn't on the mission at that time, by the way. Um, and that's the first sample that showed this highly depleted carbon. And then the rover drives down on this path in red, and then ultimately up this way. And I jump over this map, and you can see these other locations where the highly depleted carbon's been found. So not everywhere, but we've come back to it multiple times in the mission. This is the ultimate field site where the Mars Science Laboratory went and is still exploring. The reason this was chosen is because there's this big mound in the middle of Gale Crater here called Mount Sharp. 
And the side of Mount Sharp shown in this little box is basically this image on the right. From orbit, one could see that there was mineralogy that looked like it was in layers. So there's a region that is mud that is uh, rich in mudstone, and then there's a region which is rich in hematite, and then there's a region rich in clay, and then you get up into a region which has more sulfate, and then you get into a region that's all sulfate essentially from orbit. So we wanted so that I thought was by the, from from the NASA planners here um, and scientific community was that you might be seeing the progression from a wet Mars to a drier Mars. In the in the movement from the the lower sediment where it was all mudstone up into a clay unit and then up into a sulfate and clay unit and then into a sulfate unit it was the drying out of Mars. Um, all these samples though come from from before that transition, uh, with the last one that um, is in this study being on this this structure here, which is actually a pediment. So this is a this is an erosionary channel cut through the mountain and the pediment surface. Uh, uh, has uh, is one of our uh, examples that has this highly depleted value. Here's a picture of the pediment, another beautiful picture of Mars, this time with a white. Um, oh no, never mind. That's not. That's just cut out. Never mind. So here is the the pediment is this line here, blue arrow, all along here, and you can see it's a little bit of a cliff face. Uh, it's it's a, it's a sandstone that has washed out. Uh, would have continued out in three dimensions out toward the, the observer in this picture, um, but it's all been eroded away. Just like if you're out in, you know, Zion National Park or something, you see the buttes very similar. All right. Um, so this gets to what I was just saying about well, if, how do you unite those six locations together? This is where the talk gets very, very speculative. But but one possibility is that we're actually looking at some phenomena that deposited the depleted isotopes onto a paleo surface. Because somehow you have to unite a location, which is an ancient mudstone with this pediment, which came much, much later. Um, and so, so if you think about Gale Crater was a lake, that's when the mudstone formed. And then there would have been mudstone de deposit. And then you know, that would have eroded and got an erosionary surface. And then there was a dune field there. We know that. And then that got eroded uh, to give the top of the pediment surface. So if that if that's true, then then that that's one way to unite all these different material uh, locations together. Um, this is the first location. Again, there's a there's an outflow channel, which would be could be one way to deposit that highly depleted carbon um, this way, while as you're de you're depositing it also the other way down to the pediment. But that's pretty speculative. Uh, here's a beautiful picture of the la of the the pediment top. This is the erosions, erosionary surface of the pediment top. And here's a, it's, miss, it's blocked here. There's the drill core in gray. And that, that, the image, that image on the right is a, roughly similar to what your eye would see if you were on Mars. The, the color balance there is right. Okay, so what does it mean if there really is a pediment surface that got stuff deposited on that's highly depleted? Um, or paleo surface that got stuff repeated on it. What does it mean? How do you get these really strong isotope values? So obviously, obviously with my past history with methane seeps and, and stuff, I had to at least entertain the idea that this was some sort of methanotrophy where we have methane release, it's depleted, and then microbes eat it, and, and they can be highly depleted in methane, um, just like in a methane seep. Uh, the problem is we don't see any biofabrics like this. This is a picture of Earth where you see these microbial fabrics where microbes grew up in mounds. And, and this is the Tubiana formation where you get delta C13 values down to minus 60 per mil. A really great example of methane consumed by microbes in a paleo surface uh, like this. This would be the, the surface had microbes on it. But we don't see anything like that. We don't see those kind of biofabrics. So we can kind of tentatively rule that out. This is really kind of wild. Uh, you can't see the top, but one possibility is that this is actually uh, extra solar, uh, extra solar material from not from our solar system. That would have a very different isotope composition. Turns out the solar system passes through giant molecular clouds uh, once every, uh, once every about ten to eight years, and when that happens, you get a lot of um, of these cosmic dust particles in the atmosphere. 
So on Mars, where it's, which is already rather cold, that would trigger glaciation. It could also trigger glaciation on Earth. So that's been, there's been papers written about whether that has ever happened on Earth, triggering large glaciations. The giant molecular cloud has weird isotopes because it's a giant molecular cloud. It's got UV radiation going through it. And it turns out that uh, it looks like you can get values down to minus 260 per mil. So that, that's a pretty nice number. It doesn't take, you know, because we need a big signal. If we're going to sprinkle a little bit of dust and have it change our isotopes of our analysis, we would need a big signal. So that's a pretty big signal. Um, maybe not big enough because this isn't very much dust. You have to, you have to produce enough dust to change the isotopes for the whole, for the whole powder that you, that you analyzed. Um, and so that's one, one possibility. Um, we don't really have any good way to, to test it, but we have to at least have that out there as a possibility. Another possibility is that um, it comes from methane plumes. So we know methane comes out of the Martian interior occasionally. If that methane was, uh, was biological, we don't know if it is, but if it is biological, it could be C13 depleted. And if the methane then came out and reacted with other gases and UV light and made organic matter every now and then whenever a plume occurs, then you might, um, you might explain the isotopes that way. And that could, it's nice because it could also explain the sulfur. If sulfur gases uh, are also reacting to form this organic matter. So we can imagine complicated reactions in the Martian atmosphere where methane and uh, SO2 uh, and, and, and CO2 make organic matter. Uh, but it only gets highly depleted whenever there's a big, um, big uh, release of, of biological methane. Um, this could work, but it does require us to, to have biological methane on Mars, which we're not ready to, to say there is. So we will tentatively move on. Another possibility is uh, photochemistry. As I mentioned with explained isotopes, there was both the, the equilibrium fractionation, then there was the kinetic fractionation, and then there was the photochemical reactions. Photochemistry does can fractionate isotopes quite largely. So on Mars, you might have CO2 be converted to, to carbon monoxide, and then carbon monoxide converted to formaldehyde. And if all that is done with UV light uh, or, or other uh, wavelengths, uh, you could have a large fractionation. Um, so there's been th some theoretical work here shown on the right of large fractionations with, uh, with the CO2 converting to CO. <clears throat> the only uh, caveat here is that one needs to consider both CO2 going to CO and CO going back to CO2 because this, if photochemically, this should happen both directions. And so one needs to really think carefully about what happens in the Martian atmosphere to create sort of a, a photochemical equilibrium fractionation between CO2 and CO. And that, that, that work has not been done yet to my knowledge. Um, so I, I remain uh, optimistic that this might be the explanation, but we'll have to see. This on the lower right is actually the reverse reaction. This is showing a large fractionation going from CO back to CO2. And so that was, that's what gives me pause that this might not actually work out because the reverse reaction might be, have a large fractionation. There is a paper uh, submitted or maybe even been impressed. I don't, I'm not privy to the details. Um, I, was, uh, I was, I knew it was being written and I knew it got submitted from my good colleague, uh, Yurichio Yuno from Tokyo Institute of Technology, uh, where he's done really great lab work showing that there is a large isotope fractionation when you photo, uh, you photo, uh, you, you, sorry, when you um, react CO2 with, with, uh, with uh, wavelengths of light to form CO. So photochemical production of CO from CO2 does indeed have a large fractionation of, of something like 130 per mil at room temperature and even larger at Martian temperatures if you go and read the paper. So the paper, this is a, from a preprint. So this paper, um, if you know, it's, it's again in review as far as I know, uh, it's, it would argue that uh, the signal we're seeing is from, from UV reactions uh, in the atmosphere of Mars. Again, so Mars would have a very weird carbon cycle then indeed. Here's my summary. Uh, we have 24 samples spanning nine years. We gave very, very crazy isotopes, uh, which was <laughs> in some ways reminiscent of earlier in my career when I, I got to uh, go down and uh, 
submersibles. Um, but um, we don't think it's the same process. We think that indeed Mars is quite different than Earth. We have three possible explanations. One is that you have uh, biological methane coming out every now and then, reacting with UV light to make organic matter. Another possibility is that occasionally Mars and the Earth and the whole solar system go through a giant molecular cloud and you get weird, weird carbon dust settling everywhere. And then finally, the probably the, the most likely explanation, the one that certainly Yurichio Ueno is going is uh, his paper argues for, uh, is that you have UV photolysis of carbon dioxide. So on Mars, this is shown in orange here. You have Mars. You have these different gases in the atmosphere. UV light and and other uh, wavelengths of light form a whole set of different molecules, some of which can get wrapped up into organic matter and deposit on the surface, and we have a large weird isotope values that we didn't quite expect to see there. 